It's okay. I'm okay. I just slipped. Everyone slips, you know. I slip, you slip, everybody flips here. But slip it all night. Don't be alarmed. Clear the net, clear the net. Don't worry. I'm up. All right, I'm good. Everything's good. Are you guys good? I'm good. Everybody's good. I'm good. You're good. Door. We're all talking. Clear the net. Oh. Hey guys, it's Dave and Dora with Tactical Hive. And in today's video, we're going to be going over inner squad comms, you know, just kind of what we ran and how we ran it, you know, the do's and don'ts, a little bit of uh, knowledge transfer, I guess. Yeah. Dave's been at this a little bit longer than I have, so we'll go ahead and kick things off with him. Yeah, I had quite the evolution of uh, interpersonal or intercom squads. You know, like we started initially uh, when I was young with uh, the, the, it's called the PRC 126 commonly referred to as the prick 126 mm -hmm. but it was you know it was laden with issues all kinds of you know it was it was heavy it was bulky uh it, it wasn't very waterproof we found out it was raining which it always did in georgia they don't work yeah. um so uh we rapidly went away from those and we started actually going to uh aftermarket it's called cots a, a commercially off the shelf system um and we started going to different aftermarket walkie talkies um again those have limitations too um the biggest limitation is there's no comsec. You know, they can't be, uh, these can't be, well, they can be encrypted, but not military level encryption on them, right? So uh, we started using uh, ICOM primarily when I was a team leader and up, that would became the main, mm -hmm. the main radio we used. Now, at that time, how many guys in like a Ranger squad would have an ICOM? Well, Everybody in the squad would have an icon, okay. but we'd only let like three or four people speak. Like yeah. if you're a new kid, you're not speaking on the radio unless you have a very significant thing to say. Yeah, and that, and that, that, that is universal across the board. Um, you know, yes, everybody's plugged in to the net. Everybody has the ability to transmit and talk, but less is more, you know, and only the most pertinent information on an ICOM net needs to be passed because if you start clogging up the net, things that are actually important, things that, that everybody needs to hear, won't make it through because we're talking about things that aren't important enough, you know, and I can't tell you exactly what that is. You know, it's unique to everybody's situation, time and place in history. But, um, you know, that's kind of the first, uh, I guess, tip or trick, you know, if you are in a running inner squad comms, be it for whatever reason, you know, preparedness, you're having fun, your, your professional use. You really want to have that hierarchy established of who gets to say how much. But that being said, you know, if you're the lowest guy, the newest guy on the totem pole, just being able to ask a quick question, you know, like comes in handy, which I know I did starting out. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, everybody's got comms, but that doesn't mean everybody needs to be talking all at once, which is a good point that Dave brought up, which, you know, the lower on the totem pole you are, the more you need to shut up. Yeah. And listen. Yeah. Mouth shut, ears yeah. open. And trust me, I did a lot of shutting up and carrying heavy things. We all did. Yeah. Starting out. You carry heavy things and you shut up. <laughs> and I got very good at both of those things starting out as we all did. Well, I got good at carrying heavy things. Yes. <laughs> oh, yes. So the 126, you know, it was a military PRC program radio, but it really was lacking. Yep. So you went out to the civilian market as a stopgap, which often happens. Yeah. And then when did the bad boy show up oh so yeah they started coming out the, the end of the 90s yeah yeah it's by the time i got to the team or even into sqt probably buds i don't know they didn't give us gucci things and buds but we're talking about the m bitter prick 148 and that thing was just kind of a do-it-all those things were all but bulletproof um you could jump them you could dive them they were uh you know, they could handle an explosion better than you could they basically took our giant Mm -hmm. Latoon styles radios shrunk them into something you know, easily portable by one man. Yeah, you can run multiple types of crypto in those. You can run um, UHF, VHF, all that stuff. Yeah, they had uh, boosters that you could hook them up to, and, and you could run a booster like in a pouch and run it with coax. It had uh, several different types of antennas, the whip being the most common, but they had this little stubbier one that we would use from time to time for low visibility operations. And then sometimes they'd get used for uh, like shipboarding maritime. So this would work just fine. And then when you started getting out into the wilderness, the weeds, the terrain, they had the whip antennas. This is a shorty whip. The other one would have been about what, three times this length. Yeah, three times at least. Yeah, at least. Yeah. 
And uh, it was really a cool system that you could kind of pick and choose what you needed um, to make it fit the mission. And um, yeah, I can't say enough good things about them. I got to go to comm school very early on in my career, which was, you know, which was a blessing really because I had a functional um, understanding of how all the radios worked. And I did work as a comms guy, but the, I'd say the Embitter was definitely the workhorse of GWAT. Oh, for sure. hundred percent. But the problem with me with it is, again, Strong Ranger, not Smart Ranger, right? Strong Ranger, Smart Seal. I think once, it, once I lose crypto or once I bump off my channels, I'm looking for an RTO or someone who can fix it because I don't know what to do with all these buttons. I just yeah. make, it, I make it worse, but I got to make this thing. I didn't say I was good at it. <laughs> you know, I was good at radios, but I, had, I could get myself out of trouble, you know, just being able to load crypto, load uh, freaks. But uh, those things were so well thought out. And, and frankly, you know, I can't say for certain because I came later, but like ahead of their time because they stayed relevant for so long, you could slave them to each other. Mm -hmm. You know, you could load freaks in crypto very easily. Uh, we had people for that, but you could hand jam and do it yourself uh, in the field. If you were going to be out in the field during a crypto change, you could, you know, it was pretty manageable to be able to do a quick fast crypto change. Um, and those things, you know, I think there are civilian versions available yeah, the market, they're kind of dumbed down. I don't think they, they take crypto the same way. I think you have to have a hand license for them now, though. Right? Okay. Yeah, but that's definitely something to look into. But, you know, there's other options out there. You know, with these these ICOMs work great. What's the price point on these? Uh, and this is the newer one. So those have evolved a lot from when we started using, right? And mm -hmm. what we found with the ICOMs initially, they were, again, they were a commercial off-the-shelf COT system. So they weren't super ruggedized or weatherized. Um, mm -hmm over time and working with them. So now we started finding that uh, we go with, this is one of the marine grade uh, radios. So it's obviously it's got an aluminum case, aluminum body, uh, this waterproof or water resistant for you know one atmosphere. Um, price on these though is about 275 to $350 per radio. You know, there's other things out there. And the nice thing is like, you know, these, this is an American based company, mm -hmm. you know, um, the Bofang has obviously taken the commercial market by storm. These are everywhere. I mean, I don't know anybody who doesn't have one. The ones that don't have them are the ones who are like, I'm not letting China get a hold of my information. You know, I think those are the only holdouts. I was a holdout for a long yeah, time. Yeah, because like half to two thirds of everything you've ever owned wasn't made in China. <laughs> right, like, right. But those are the guys that don't want to buy a Bofang and they also don't want to buy a Hollow Sun, you know, and yeah. to each his own. Mm -hmm. But uh, I bought two um, because I needed to expand my comms. I didn't have the cash for it. And like this little radio right here and this is their um their bf f8 hp model which is one of their higher end models um and the thing only costs like it's under a hundred dollars and what i like about this is like we start talking about push to talk and integrating it with our comms and our and our headsets mm -hmm. you know these are all aftermarket headsets well a headset for this costs more than the radio the, or the ptt the push to talk for this is literally around close to four hundred dollars it's, really? it's insane. That PTT and the wait mark, the wait point for that is about six to seven months to wait for it. As to where, you know, this is the aftermarket one for the ICOM. Mm -hmm. And this is the aftermarket one for the Bofang. This one's like $50. The, the only really con to it is, again, the connection point for it. It's not really waterproofed at all. Yeah. So if you're in any type of inclement weather, it does affect your comms. And it also snag hazard, it unsnags easy. As for these, these thread on to the radio. So pros and cons to them. Okay. Yeah, definitely going to get what you pay for, but you can make it work. And uh, any comms is better than no comms, unless you get, go back to crowding the net with unnecessary communications, which kind of negates the advantage in the first place. <laughs> so, you know, got to watch out for that. Um, you know, as far as how we set up our comms, it did evolve, you know, rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know who makes the decisions of what kind of comm suites we're going with. I know in the Navy, we ran Peltors and Sordans for quite a while. These are the Peltors. These things are very old. They still work great. Um, when we started running the side rails, is kind of the first gen we went with. I know you got those too. Yep. But there were some other, you know, stuff that we used from other co companies. Um, Sordans are really good for headsets and push to talks. They're one of the first ones we started with. Yeah, yeah. We would use, I would use, I would tend to use the Sordans for maritime. I think they did better. Um, you know, again, they're, they're not, I don't think they're swimmable, but um, we had other, other comms for that, but they were definitely like, you know, on the surface. You know, that PTT is huge for a Sordan. 
Yeah, there were different different ones. The uh, the Sorens that I had actually used the same push to talks as the Peltors. They were really the same. I remember when we got ours, you know, it comes in a package and you dump it out and uh, the PT team ever had those almost like a, it looked like a Chevron. I don't know, it looked like a big circle. Pretty much it had all these little weird buttons around it. It was... Yeah, I was able to use the same push to talks for both systems and then things started to change. You know, we... Um, we used the Secret Service style in Vizios. Mm -hmm. and those were amazing. You could shoot with those. You could be under a helicopter with one of those, get in and out of a helicopter with one of those and still make comms. They were absolutely incredible. Uh, they weren't overly robust, so you had to be careful with them because that's you know not what they were, their intended purpose was. Uh, I don't have one of those anymore. I just found that out today. I thought I, I, thought I did. <laughs> but um, as you can see in the pictures, you know they're, they're very much so just like something a Secret Service guy would wear. Silence was a company. Yeah, Silence were also used. Those guys were not a big fan of whatever system they went with. So I just stayed with the older stuff. Yeah. I like and it wasn't those. until you started seeing like the Ops Core stuff starting to come out that that stuff went away. But um, Invisio, Silence, Peltor, Sorden, you know, all that stuff got used. And then I think Ops Core and probably some of those other companies are still, but you know, I can't really speak to what is currently going you know, down. The beauty of these, <clears throat> and you know, and Peltors and Sorters, they both do the same, right? But you'll see me and Dor, both of us right now have dual comm sets, right? Yeah. So running my dual comm set, I can run one for my inter squad. That's running just my squad internal off this one radio. And this one here could run to a different radio. So if I had an inbitter where I'm working in the, you know, the command and control side of the house for things, you know, and I gotta talk to adjacent units or whatever, you know, I can talk on my big radio through these and they connect the same way. So now just like his setup, you see Dor's got two push to talk yeah. set up on his on his carriers you know as where your average assaulter who doesn't have a secondary radio would have just one his peltors would only just have one lead off of them they wouldn't give them two they just give him a single yeah and for that dual radio purpose we ran with the uh the harris 152s they were green and you know more inner squad duty was relegated to the embitter and then for command and control, um, assets, be it rotary, fixed or ground or, or water, I guess, boats. Um, you would generally talk to them with those. Uh, they've got new radios out now that are hit and miss or, you know, opinions variable to yeah. say the least. Yeah. But, um, you know, that's what they're currently doing. But yeah, running those 150, running the 148 PRC embitter and then the, uh, the 152 Harris and just having a place on your kit for both of them. <laughs> Back in the old, old school, you'd see guys putting their radios on their backs, like on their shoulders. Like any 90s action star worth his salt did at least one scene in one movie with his radio like sticking out over his shoulder. You want to go old school. This yeah. is like, this is again, this is late 90s, right? Mm -hmm. um, late 90s, we didn't have these fancy Peltors and stuff, you know, and you're doing a live fire. So you've got your handy dandy earplugs shoved in mm -hmm. and you've got your Prick 126 down here with your and it's the old, you know, the, looks like a telephone handle. Remember those? Yeah, like the non one. Yeah, it looks <laughs> just like that, right? And you have it shoved underneath your helmet. Yeah. It's shoved in your helmet, it's jacked under your ear, and it's put into your chin strap, and it's smashed up here. Yeah. And that was your, that's so you could hear under gunfire. But the problem was you had to have it turned all the way up so you could hear it over your ear pro, mm -hmm. which means, you know, your, your threat, your yeah. threat you're moving against can hear you not, too. Not often, but when I could get away with it, because I was a comms guy for a while. And when I came, and I was like a third string comms guy. I was like a new guy. Yeah. Really like the JTAC, like, you know, legit dudes did all the heavy lifting. But I would run the man pack on lower level missions. And a lot of those lower level missions required a lot of hiking. So I would run the Invisio because wearing these in the field, not the deal. They're super hot, you know, um, for long distance, for humping. And they do pop out, you know, to give you a little bit of relief. But now you don't have noise canceling capability. You don't have your ear pro and... You can still hear fine as long as it's not a loud environment. But anyway, I, with the Invisio, would run the old NOM handset. No good. Yeah, and I would just clip it onto my gear because it was more of a traditional RTO. We weren't inter-squad communicating with it. Yeah. And um, it bit me in the ass one night because we got into it pretty close, pretty... We ended up doing like a center peel down a road and around a corner. And so I'm the calm guy passing, you know, <laughs> pro words, which are just... 
any just random words that have you know a significant meaning and there's an execution checklist with all the pro words oftentimes uh you know you go with themes like football teams or brands of alcohol or anything like that you keep it you know kind of to one genre so anywho i've got you know we're just going to do this thing we're not expecting contact we're in a very small element uh and six or seven guys and uh, so we get into it you know we're, we're banging away at these guys we're breaking contact <laughs> and at one point i was making cobs and i had to grab my gun and start shooting back as we were moving so i dropped the headset just dangling yeah <laughs> just instinctively drop the hands i get my gun back up i'm shooting and i still need to make comms so now i'm running for my life down the street like there's rounds ripping through freaking everywhere and i'm dang i'm grab, reaching down grabbing my headset like passing you know two words that they're launching qrf and like they're spinning things up and then i'm like oh, i gotta shoot again drop my headset grab my gat like start shooting in like oh i gotta go oh, i gotta make comms again <laughs> so even when you don't think it was going to happen, maybe going with the dual headset, dual, you know, push to talks, even if you were running a man pack, which again, isn't even that, you know, likely to happen anymore because the small radio has gotten so good. Yeah, they're tiny. And the relay, the ability to relay has gotten better. But yeah, that was kind of an interesting night where I was just going back and forth, back and forth. Because when you're in the heat of the moment, you don't have time to like clip that handset back onto your kit. Like you are, you know, so... That was interesting. So that was the last <laughs> time I ever used the OG handset in the <laughs> There's a reason why it's evolved. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody else was, I was the only guy doing it. Of course. Because you know, like, the main guys were always doing comp stuff. Because on, on a big mission, when you know there's going to be assets, you know there's going to be lots of stuff going on, like that's their job, right? right? You know? But, you know, like third string E4 me, just like, ah, oh, whatever. You know, we're just going out, doing this little thing, coming back. I made comps and nobody got shot on our side. But, um, <laughs> You know, it was just kind of a fun, interesting learning experience. I'll tell you one thing for you guys out there watching. Um, if you're looking at getting the comp set up, right? One thing to consider, and this happens across the board, uh, think about how many, like, think about an average school shooting or, uh, you know, some, some active shooter response. And you got five or six units all responding and none of them can talk, right? All these different agencies can't talk. So if you're running an ICOM, which has preset channels on it, right? So these channels are preset. You can't mm -hmm. really change them versus running a a, a, a boy fang, which now you can actually plug your radios in. You can plug your freaks into this one like we did in the military. So if, if you're going to do cross communication with radios like this, um, you go through and, and put on this one here, the one that has preset channels, you need to find out uh, what that channel list is and what frequencies they're transmitting and receiving on. That allows you to set up what's called an SOI or what we call an SOI, which is uh, signal operating instructions. And that just allows you to be able to plug this radio in so we can talk to this radio and vice versa. Just keynote. Yeah. And so in the military, that was called a comms wheel. And so you'd have your most pertinent, important freaks, channels preset up front, you know, channel one, channel two. And that's going to be your no shit inner squad comms where you're talking with the guys that you are with. And that could have, and that could be anywhere from, you know, two to 20 guys, 30 guys, you know, just depending on what it can have. That would be a lot, but I've seen it go well past 20 with, with just on inner squad and it can work, but that discipline of priority and who gets to talk and for what reasons you're allowed to talk based on your rung on the ladder, that really does come into play the more people you have on there. But, you know, that's going to be most important. After that, you know, you might have leadership specific channels. Um, oftentimes those guys will be just running a completely separate radio and they'll have their inner squad freaks on one radio and then their leadership freaks on another. And then from there, there's always that next higher level of leadership that isn't out there. They're just like that guy in the, in the dark room full of TV screens. He's got a freaking cigar, maybe an eye patch, and he's always scowling and people are scared to talk to him. Like those dudes exist, all right? And um, so you're going to need to be able to talk to that guy because in case something bad happens or you really need to pivot um, you know, he, that backup echelon, that, that the joint operation center, those are the guys that are going to really be, again, gals that are really going to be making things happen behind the scenes, so to speak. So if you have that capability, you know, if you, if you're, you're living in that world, you definitely need to be able to get back and forth to those types of freaks and those channels, you know, they're preset one through 10 or whatever it is on your radio. You need to take some time and practice, you know, getting to those channels. And you don't have to click it, you know, and at first you're just going to be counting clicks, 
But after a while, like you can get good at it and you know what a three click put a uh, turn is. You know what a four click turn is. You know what a six click turn is. A five click turn should be about a 180, but radios vary. Um, but you know, being able to, to talk to who you need to talk to exactly when you need to be able to talk to them. Um, that is a skill set all in itself. It's not enough just to have this stuff. Yes, you got to have it, of course. You got to be able to carry it effectively and you got to understand how it works. But, you know, finding that balance of, you know, when to talk and who to talk to, you know, that takes experience and everybody's got to be on the same sheet of music. Um, you know, going back to the gear, you know, we talked a little bit about the helmets. You know, these things are adjustable. You don't have to have the Gucci rails like this. They do make calm setups that'll work in conjunction with wearing helmets and that's how we all both started yep exactly um remember we used to strip these out that's why the old helmets had pads here you could yeah you could rip you out never have padding on that absolute on the absolute top of the helmet you balance the helmet on your, the top of your forehead and it's uh back here on the top of the back of your head and that was to keep the uh the headset in but we also had headsets that went around soft, the back yeah those soft ones too right yeah and then the invisios were great and then we had those maritime headsets that were like cloth that's what i'm saying yeah. rubber yeah, yeah. yeah and those kind of sucks but they were very low viz they were very um easy to use with helmets and even other types of headgear um and they were literally waterproof you could swim you could make comms while you're swimming huh like, did it sound like did it sound like <laughs> you know you, you need to get the surface <laughs> swimming we have a whole different a whole different thing for underwater um but uh but yeah you know Spending time with this stuff, not only as an individual, but whoever you're going to be communicating with, be it, um, you know, out there with them or that next rung uh, back at those, the jock, you know, the guy with the eye patch, you know, you don't want to say the wrong thing to that guy. All right. Because he ain't going to forget. Um, but, you know, as far as running on kits, I ran a lot of different kits, you know, I had a lot of different jobs, but, you know, this is just a universal generic plate carrier. And we got asked in uh, the previous video we made about mag placement, a lot about radio placement. Mm -hmm. And so on these more modern plate carriers, you can just buy these, these uh, comm pouches that just kind of clip right into your plate carriers. You know, this is the Cry version. The Feral Concept version is exactly the same as far as I know. A lot of guys use those as well. What, uh, what's the make model on that plate carrier? This is a tier. A tier, yeah. T Y. You keep your comp. T Y R. So I, I run them in two places. I either run them. So I have my, because my biggest thing I hated the most mm -hmm. about the old antennas was we used to run them right here, mm -hmm. and so you always had this in your face, right? Yeah. Hey, hate it. Absolutely hate it. Um, so which is why I went to a remote antenna setup, mm -hmm. right? So I'll run this in this pouch right here, and then I'll run this remote antenna to it. The nice thing about the remote antenna is now I no longer have to have this, right? I still have, I have a whip antenna on this one. And you can see in this pocket here, it runs around and comes up the back. So it looks kind of like this. Yeah, and what Dave's referring to is a coax cable. Yep. So I also would run my antennas on the backside of plate carriers when I could. Um, it was really hard to waterproof these. So being in the Navy, that could be an issue. But if you were in a time and place where that wasn't so much an issue, you wouldn't worry about it. But you could run rigorous tape and things around, you know, try to, you know, make a little bit, make it a little harder for uh, water to get in there. Yep, but um, yep. I, I just constantly switched kits so, so much, especially in training. Because in training, you're, you're in the mountains, you're on the ocean, you're under the water, you're in the desert, you're in wooded areas, you're doing tons of assaults. Like the job would just constantly change. So I would be wearing different types of kit, running different types of weapon systems. Um, having different types of jobs. So unless I was going somewhere, like finally on deployment, I generally wouldn't run these just because it was just a pain in the butt, you yeah. know? And then if you're running, yeah. you're but running chest running rigs. Running through your molly and everything. You know, but if you're running chest rigs with, yeah, without not armor, option. not an option. And then a lot of my slick plate carriers that I would wear under my chest rigs didn't have molly. I tell you what I do a lot, a lot of times too, if I'm not running in a pocket like that, mm -hmm. these radios here, if you have it, I'll have an extra magazine pouch on the back somewhere. Yeah. And they fit great and they're nice and sturdy. I mean, it holds just like I do with my magazines, you know? You can run it over top, you can run the tab and lock it in place, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's a good option. Again, what, I, what you have to be careful if you're gonna run it like this, 
you have to be cognizant of the light you're going to emit if you're receiving or sending a call. You don't want every time you're on the radio, because this is on your back, or, or this is off to your side over here, mm -hmm. every time you're hitting comms coming in or out, this little light box lighting up and just kind of giving away your position, because that's... Yeah, definitely a no-no. You also notice that the, like the inner squad, the first radio or the first of two, because you're always going to have at least one, we would generally run on our support side. We don't want one more thing getting in the way of our primary weapon as we manipulate it. And generally when you're out in the field, like your hand stays on the pistol grip of your primary pretty much the entire time you're out there. So being able to hit that push to talk with your shooting hand on the weapon at all times really comes in handy. Yeah. And then um, on one of these push to talks, as you can see, we uh, we had a hack, you know, before the Gucci stuff started coming out. Where we would just cut the tops off of water bottles, you know, where the the threads are, and we would just tape them on to the huh. uh, the push to talks, and that kept from from, from yeah hot hot miking. miking, which is an accidental discharge of your push to talk, and hot miking constantly happens, especially when you're constantly changing rigs that you're not familiar with. <laughs> you're throwing something together at the hot last minute, especially during the assault or you know crucial yeah. crucial moment of the crucial yeah, moment of the operation. There's just uh, that inevitably things are just going to lean up on this and again it just rolls back to experience guys you know be cognizant of things don't be afraid just because you think you know the way you want to run your comm setups if it doesn't work out for you because you're constantly hot miking or it's getting in the way it's getting snagged on things if that's happening in a controlled safe and sane training environment once things pop off and you're doing stuff for real at full speed just uh, expect those problems to multiply yeah, these, these Bofang aftermarket ones, Yeah, that's so easy to hot mic on. At, at least this one here was just made by, uh, this is made by Atlantic Signal. It's a little more recess, a little more reset. You have to make it more of a constant effort, but still, if you lay something flat against it, you're going to hot mic. Yeah, definitely. So just a quick little hack. You just cut the top of the water bottle off, just the threaded cap area. There's usually a lip there. Just saw it right off. Overseas, there's literally an endless amount of water bottles. There's, there's towers of them pallets of them get your squad home crafting on day on yeah and then you just kind of tape it down the tape wears off i always used electrical tape i think it was a little bit kept it a little tighter and in place but that stuff's going to wear off you just keep reapplying it and uh it worked out great this one doesn't have one so the likelihood of this um hot miking far greater but i could easily throw one on there and one size fits all for the most part you know it doesn't have to be perfect um you just need it to work spare batteries Yep, two is, batteries. two is one, one is none, you know, and your batteries are going to fail you when you need them most. So definitely have a, have a backup. Just some tips and tricks, guys, based on our experiences, you know, there's different types of headsets, but they have pluses and minuses, you know, obviously that Invisio secret service bodyguard style was awesome in hot weather. It was awesome when you're humping and sweating because these, uh, Full size ones, you know, that just, I mean, I can feel <laughs> the sweat pouring out, out of my head down into my shirt. You ever just, pull them off and your ears are kind of wrinkly like your fingers? Yeah, get I mean, it's, it's, it's horrendous. And it just goes to how well these are made because literally, like, we showed up with four headsets and all four of them are the same set of Peltors. And these are old. You know, I didn't bring the swords, but the swords are basically the same thing. And I use those swords, like I said, in maritime environment, which is very unforgiving to electronics. And those held up too. And then, um, you know, that Invisio was a great niche mm -hmm. niche headset. It, um, a lot of guys used them. Some guys used them way more than even I did because I thought that it had its limitations, especially if I, if I thought we were going to go make a lot of noise on purpose. You know, um, I really wouldn't want to be running that. Though that night that I was talking about, I definitely had that shit in because I didn't think we were going <laughs> to happen. I'll be honest, you know, I didn't think it was going to happen. But um, she needed to call somebody. Yeah. You know, but uh, we got through it. You know, I was out there with awesome dudes and uh, they handled business while I was fidgeting for my radio. Literally running down the street with the, you know, the the freaking slinky cord. And, <laughs> oh, I can see you it. You know, cord. And it's like, I'm like, oh, I'm making calls. Like, I, can see, I can see it around because it'll, it'll, it'll stretch out and it'll catch you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Pistol landers do that too when you're getting shot at because I've also had that happen. <laughs> if you're going to use a mag pouch for your pistol, a, of course, have a lanyard and use the flap to keep it locked in place because someone might just start running their bell gun right at your face and you got to do the bullet dance, which is not graceful. Um, but yeah, which take, you know, which brings us to another point is lanyards and secured storage. So most embitter pouches come with, you know, a fast tech system. 
that really locks it in place, you know, dedicated radio comms pouches. But if you're running like what I just showed you, these uh, stretchy ones, that's a concern because losing a radio is a big, big deal, but, uh, especially in the government. There's, you know, crypto and things that could have horrendous repercussions that could affect the entire force, the entire military. So we would always lanyard our radios in. Well, regiment lanyards, everything. Yeah. 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 Everything. And, and these aftermarket ones here, both of these you can see have lanyard anchor points on the edge, you know, built into the systems, uh, which is good. You know, I think the most ridiculous one I saw was. Yeah. And then like a lot of them will come with something that's just for that. So if I was going to run this uh, radio, we were going to go out, uh, do mobility stuff, you know, mess around with side by sides or quads or whatever, or we were going to go do, you know, you name run it. and gun, tactical gunfighter class or anything like that, where we're going to be running around, getting up, getting down, maybe diving into, you know, stealing home plate, whatever it is. We're going to kind of hold for that, but you know, it's kind of old habits. I would definitely just girth hitch this through Molly. At a minimum. At a minimum. Yeah. You're like you always want to keep this stuff um, attached. Same thing with the push to talks. You know, if I was going to go out and use these in the field, like I did before, I would generally zip tie these onto the Molly mm -hmm. or I would run rubber bands through the molly and I would anchor them on. You always want to have like T TPI. So you've got the metal clamps and they're fairly, they're fairly sturdy. Mm -hmm. You know, they're designed to be standalone and work well. But if you're going to be doing any kind of crazy athletic explosive exercise, be it by design or not by design, it kind of ends up being the same and being able to make sure everything stays the same. Because for the reasons that, for the reasons I already spoke to when I was searching for that handset while we were, you know, getting shot at quite a bit, um, you know, I had to stop what I was doing and pick that thing up. And it was always right in front of me. I kept the, the cord fairly short, thank God. But um, <laughs> like, you know, Simpson, that was like a, you know, a I, lessons I, learned, you know? Lesson, so, you know, yeah, oh, dude, I wish I had it on video. Because I, oh, man, that was, we should have had ISR of that. Yeah. There was no ISR because nothing was supposed to happen. <laughs> this is like a low grade off, man. Like nothing was anyway. Um, but just based, making sure, you know, because it's very important. Being able to concisely and immediately pass vital information saves lives. Mm -hmm. You can also take them. Yes. But more importantly, save them. And you want to make sure your push to talks are good to go. They're always in the same spot because you're going to build that muscle memory. And that muscle memory under the stress of, you know, about being about to die, it, it transfers over from firearms manipulation right to your comms. Because the comms, some would say, is the most important thing you have on you, which we know is bullshit. Your guns are the most important thing you have on you. But comms are right up there. You know, shoot, move, communicate. Yeah, shoot, move, communicate. You know, you got your boots, you got your gats, and you got your comms. And uh, that is the trifecta of the top tier of importance. So if you are going to be running this stuff, you're going to be training hard, you know, you're ready for bad times. Make sure you got this stuff anchored in and it's always in the same spot. So you can build that consistency just like you do with your ammunition, etc. Because, um, wow, what can happen will happen. I would say for you guys out there that, uh, you know, I see a lot of you guys come to class. A lot of guys train, which is good. We're seeing more and more guys come to train in their kit. And that's where a lot of lessons learned about like what kit works and what doesn't is by getting up and getting down and training with it. This is the one thing I see trained on the least, but it's one of the most important things when shit really goes bad. Yeah. You know, so if you got a group, if you're a family or whatever, and you guys train together, train your comms. It doesn't have to be super tactical. You can, no. get, you can get in vehicles, go to the mall and work stuff, you know, and however you want to do it, but train your comms plans and start finding your holes in them so you can address those before it's an issue. All right, guys, so that's just our quick two cents. You know, we thought we'd bust this stuff out and kind of talk about it a little bit. Got a little bit into the history of what we used, but, you know, radio's a radio, but as long as you, you've got that, everybody's got the same radio, you're able to make comms, it doesn't have to be the same make model, but you've got your freaks worked out. Um, encryption's a different animal, but... Um, <laughs> People that make the, the encryption know how to break the encryption, just so just keep that in mind. Yeah. And, um, you know, just a little bit of the how we kind of came about, the way we set up our stuff, you know, different environments. I generally ran my comms the same way. It was really more so what type of weapon system I was running, what role I was filling that would start to dictate me changing things around. But for that general play carrier setup, be it dry land or maritime, it basically stayed the same. And, um, you know, anyway, got anything else, bud? No, man, like I said, get out there and train with it. Train yeah. with this the same way you would train with your rifle. Get it figured out now before you need to use it for real. Cool. All right, guys. This is David Dorr, Tattoo Live, out.